You know that feeling when something's off but you can't put your finger on it. I had that feeling for a while. My wife and I had been together for nine years. Things seemed good on the surface, but something was bugging me. She was less affectionate in recent weeks, wasn't coming home right after work like she used to. I didn't violate her privacy, didn't accuse her of anything. I was going to find out on my own. I thought long and hard before deciding what to do confronting her without evidence seemed like a bad move so I opted for a different route hiring a private investigator I did my research found a private investigator with solid reviews and set up meeting here's the deal I told him laying out what I was feeling and what I suspected. Keep an eye on my wife for a week, maybe two. I need to know what's really going on. The private investigator took some notes and we agreed on the terms. Before leaving his office, I handed him a key to her car. Place a voice activated recorder in there. It's better if we have all possible evidence. He nodded and assured me he'd handle it. Within a week he contacted me. Got something you should see he said. We arranged another meeting this time at a coffee shop. He presented me with photos audio recordings and even video evidence of my wife's affair with her best friend's husband. As I took in the evidence I felt oddly calm. The unknown was worse at least now I had clarity. I thanked the private investigator and paid him for his services. Now with everything laid bare, it was time to plan my next move. Confronting her wasn't on my mind. I had a better idea and it was time to set it in motion. The minute I stepped out of that coffee shop, I knew what I had to do next. Find a good divorce attorney. With the evidence in hand, I wanted to make sure that when the dust settled, I'd be standing on solid ground. So I started doing what I do best, research. I dug through legal websites, read reviews, and even asked some business acquaintances for their recommendation. After compiling a short list, I picked the one who seemed like he knew his stuff based on the reviews I read. When we met, he asked what brought me into his office. I simply told him I want to file for divorce and I've got substantial evidence to make my case. I handed him the folder containing everything the private investigator had given me. He opened it, flipping through photos and other documents. This is more than enough to file for a fault-based divorce, especially here in Louisiana. He said, I then told him I own two marketing firms and she's a secretary at a law firm what's the best way to protect my assets. I asked getting down to the nitty gritty the attorney says we'll need to take a look at your finances in more detail but off the bat I say start separating your financial ties to her as much as possible that's all I needed to hear. We discussed the fees, timelines, and what to expect in court. He assured me we had a strong case and said he would file the paperwork as soon as possible. I left this office feeling like a man with a plan. First I had to make sure my finances were bulletproof. I contacted my insurance provider and removed her from all the policies. Health, life, couldn't do car insurance yet. No need for her to benefit from my hard-earned money anymore. Next, I called the credit card companies. Canceling her cards was as easy as answering a few security questions. While I was at it, I moved some of my assets around, putting them in places she couldn't touch. It took the better part of a day, but when I was done, I felt untouchable. Meanwhile, life at home was as if nothing had changed, which was the eerie part. She was still her cheerful self, planning weekend outings and talking about future vacations. I played along. The contrast between our home life and what I was setting in motion felt surreal, like I was living a double life. I'd done everything I could do legally and financially, and now it was just a matter of time. I wasn't naive. I knew she might suspect something. She might notice her credit card is not working or find an insurance paper lying around. But I had already built my fortress and now all that remained was to pull up the drawbridge. Fast forward a few weeks and I was starting to grow impatient. That's when I got the call from my attorney. The papers are ready. You just need to sign them and we can serve her anytime you want. That afternoon, I found myself back at the attorney's office pen in hand, signing the papers that would end my nine-year marriage. Once the last signature was down, my attorney said, I will put a rush on this. She will be served within a week. And just like that, the wheels were in motion. There was no turning back now. I was about to drop a bombshell that would shatter the illusion we'd been living. The irony wasn't lost on me. She worked as a secretary at a law firm. Yet she was about to be caught completely off guard by a legal maneuver. As I drove back home, the reality of what I was about to do started to sink in. But any second thoughts were quickly overshadowed by the crystal clear memory of the evidence I'd seen, the betrayal I'd felt. I was ready for the next chapter, whatever it held. After signing the divorce papers, there was a certain tension in the air, like before a big storm, except she was still in the dark and that was a storm that was about to hit. My attorney had told me she'd be served within a week. So each time the doorbell rang each time there was a knock I couldn't help but wonder if this was the moment then it happened I was working in my home office when I heard the doorbell ring followed by muffled voices a minute later she walked into my office holding the papers with the confused look on her face. Is this some kind of joke? She asked no joke. I said, I think it's all very clear. She went through the pages, her eyes scanning the legal language, until she found the part about her affair. But how did you? 
doesn't matter, I interrupted. The important thing is, I know. She tried to speak, to explain, or maybe deny it. But what was there to say? The evidence was irrefutable. Instead, she left the room, and for the first time in our nine-year marriage, we slept in separate bedrooms. We didn't speak much in the days leading up to the court hearing. She hired an attorney and there was some back and forth between the legal teams. She seemed to think she could win the house and alimony. I had to give her credit for her optimism. The court date arrived and we found ourselves sitting on opposite sides of the courtroom. After some preliminary questions and statements from our attorneys, it was time for the evidence. My client has been faithful and supportive throughout their marriage. Her attorney began building her case for alimony. An asset division. It seemed like a rehearsed speech, painting her as a committed spouse. Then it was my attorney's turn. My attorney presented substantial evidence gathered by the private investigator to prove that this is a fault-based case. He started laying out the photos, the audio recordings, and the videos, providing the court with time stamps and context for each. The judge took his time going through it all. Finally, it's clear that this is not a simple case of marital discord. Given the evidence presented, I find it hard to justify awarding alimony or any substantial assets to the defendant. The ruling was swift. She would get to keep her clothes, some furniture, and her three-year-old car. No house, no alimony, no slice of my businesses. As for me, I kept what I had worked hard for, protected by the undeniable evidence I'd collected. It was over just like that. We left the courtroom and it felt like walking out of a prison. She looked at me perhaps searching for some sign of emotion but my face remained impassive. I had been through a range of feelings throughout this ordeal but at this moment all I felt was relief. We went our separate ways. I had trusted my gut, taken calculated steps and come out the other side intact. And as for her, well, she had made her bed, now she had to lie in it. As I got into my car and drove away, I couldn't help but think about the turning point this day represented. It was the end of a chapter, yes, but it was also the beginning of something new. I was a free man and the road ahead was wide open. The court hearing had drawn a line in the sand and I was now officially on the other side of it. With the legality sorted, my focus shifted to the fallout, particularly how to deal with our circle of friends and family. They all need to know, of course, and I wanted to control the narrative before rumors started flying. First, I called my family. They'd always been supportive and were equally so now. So now the information hit them like a ton of bricks, but they understood why I had taken the actions I had. Next, I moved on to my friends. The reactions were mixed. Some were shocked, some expressed their regrets, but all understood the logic behind my move. The most intriguing conversation was yet to come though. It was time to talk to the wife of my wife's affair partner, her best friend. I had the evidence and she had the right to know. I set up a meeting with her at a coffee shop, a neutral space for what would surely be a charged conversation. I could tell she was uneasy, probably wondering why I'd asked to see her. I'll cut to the chase, I said, sliding an envelope across the table. You should know the truth. She opened the envelope and began to examine the evidence. Her face went through a range of expressions, surprise, confusion, and finally realization. I had a feeling, she finally said, but I never wanted to believe it. The conversation that followed was summer. We shared our thoughts, our confusion, and in some odd way, our mutual sense of liberation. She thanked me for bringing this to light and assured me she'd take appropriate action. With the most difficult conversations behind me, I set out to inform my wife's family and the remaining friends. I sent a group email, attaching some of the evidence and explaining my actions as plainly as possible. I braced myself for backlash, but was met with mostly understanding, some even applauding my decisive action. In the meantime, I began to remove her from my life systematically. Personal items were packed and moved to a storage unit for her to collect. I even managed to navigate the tricky waters of social media by updating my relationship status to single, which felt like another small victory. At work, I started throwing myself into various projects. Business didn't wait for personal upheavals. The emails still arrived, meetings still had to be attended, and campaigns had to be devised. In the midst of this whirlwind, I found peace. My business was something I built from the ground up. It was my accomplishment, and no amount of personal chaos could take that away from me. Though my life had changed dramatically, my day-to-day -day remains largely the same. Friends and family adjusted to the new normal, and I discovered who was truly there for me when the chips were down, and through it all, I maintained a sense of dignity, a sense of control that was mine and mine alone. I had navigated through one of life's toughest storms, and I had done it my way. Fast forward a few months, the dust settled and the new reality took shape. I found myself in a strangely comforting routine, free from the turmoil that had dominated the past year. I started traveling for business more, focusing on expanding my marketing firms into new markets. The change of scenery was invigorating and the extra responsibilities filled any void left by my personal life's upheaval. Simultaneously, my social circle underwent its transformation. 
Some friends drifted away, uncomfortable with the new dynamics, but others stepped up, proving their worth. Dinners and game nights took on a different tone, lighter and more genuine. My family, too, seemed closer than before, as if the events had reminded us of what really mattered. As for her, word got around that she had moved out of state, probably hoping for a fresh start. The wife of her affair partner also filed for divorce. She thanked me again, admitting that while painful, the truth has set her on a new, hopefully happier path. With my past sorted, my eyes started drifting toward the future. At a business mixer, I met Diane, a fellow entrepreneur. The spark was immediate we talked about business life and everything in between for the first time in a long while I felt a connection that was both intellectual and emotional Diane was different confident self-sufficient and grounded she had built her own tech startup and navigated her way through life's challenges with finesse I was drawn to her not as a replacement for what I had lost but as a new chapter that was about to take place in my life. We started dating cautiously at first but then with increasing enthusiasm as we discovered how much we had in common. She understood my past, respected my decisions, and offered a partnership that felt equal and fulfilling. My life was back on track. But it was a different track one that looked far more promising than the one I had been on there were no guarantees, of course. But that was fine life was a series of choices and for the first time in a long while I felt like I was making the right ones the ordeal had taught me that while we can't control what happens to us we can't control how we react and sometimes reacting wisely can turn a negative into a life-altering positive. I had lost in marriage but gained a deeper understanding of myself a stronger relationship with my family and friends and a promising new love. So there I was years after saying I do finding myself in a place where I was ready to explore new commitments new adventures with the divorce behind me and the future brimming with possibilities. I was starting anew, the author of my own life story. And let me tell you, it was shaping up to be a good one. Diane and I have been dating for almost a year now, but I told her I have no plans on getting remarried anytime soon. She understands and we are just taking it one day at a time. 